Well, hi everyone. This is Philip Shields. Thank you for coming to our website, Light on the Rock. We gave a sermon, a message, a teaching, whatever some of you like to call it, about tithing in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament. We didn't quite finish it, so I'm going to spend the first part of this teaching, tithing in the New Covenant, by finishing some questions that came up about the Old Testament tithing. And so please be understanding that. I need to fill in some gaps. I need to answer some questions that came up after that first one. And actually, this particular recording is actually a, an, an, it's actually an update, an update of the one I already had up there earlier, a month or two ago. So anyway, so welcome again. And if you're responding to ads that we have placed from around the world, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you very much for coming. And I hope you let others know about it, and I hope you keep coming back, because we just can't afford to keep buying ads. We bought a few, a handful, and that's about it. Anyway, back to the message. I want to, first of all, just address some things quickly in the New Covenant tithing, so you don't feel that somehow I'm setting the stage that we don't have to support God's work in the New Covenant. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. In fact, our Savior, our Savior, the Lord says that it's a command of His, His command, that those who are preaching the gospel are also cared for by the gospel. How would you talk about it if you were the one giving the sermon? In the New Testament, in the New Testament, is tithing a command or is it just a principle? I think that's very important. We'll post up there now 1 Corinthians 9 verses 13 and 14, and look what Paul says. Do you not know, we'll come back, by the way, later in this teaching to this very chapter, because it has a lot to say about supporting God's work in the New Covenant, in the New Testament. So 1 Corinthians 9, verse 13, <clears throat> Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple, and those who serve at the altar... The, the priests, in other words, partake of the offerings of the altar. Even so, the Lord, Yeshua, Jesus Christ, has commanded that those who teach and preach the gospel, those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. It's a commandment of our Savior. In fact, Paul may have been taking this from something he heard back in Luke 10, verse 7, when Jesus had sent out disciples out into the field, I think 70 of them, two by two, and he said, if someone invites you to their house and wants to take care of you and host you and feed you and all of that, hey, accept it. So that's the context of Luke 10, 7. Remain in that same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages." Worthy of his hire, worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. Now, the new covenant also, keep in mind, magnifies the old covenant. So in the new covenant, if you're angry at someone without a cause, that could be seen as murder because it's you've got hate in your heart. If you hate somebody in your heart without a cause, or if you hate somebody, that, that could be seen as murder. Lust can be seen as adultery and so forth. And so in the New Covenant, the tithing laws of the Old Covenant are actually magnified, as you'll see. We're no longer confined, as, we, as defined in the Old Covenant tithing, as I clearly, I think, showed last time. It's no longer confined. The tithe, remember, a tithe means 10%. God says, you can have everything I give you, but 10% of it has to come back to me. But the 10% was on specific things. It was on the fruit, the products of the land, on cereals, on grain, uh, olive, olives and olive oil and vineyards and wine. And that's the produce of the land. As well as every tenth sheep, goat, or ox that went through your county, every, every tenth one that had been born uh, since the last time. Every tenth one. If you only had nine, there's nothing to tithe on as far as livestock goes. 
If you had 17, you only had one to tithe on. You didn't quite have the second tenth one. And so God was showing that uh, he was looking at the tenth in that case and not the first out of, out of ten or nine or whatever. Okay, so the tenth one. You'll also see as we go along that God wants us to support those who are preaching and teaching his word correctly. I hope we are here at Light on the Rock that we are to support them graciously, gratefully, worshipfully, happily, cheerfully. We're going to see all those verses later on today. The New Testament moves from the Old Covenant, have to do, you, you, were, you had to tithe. And it had to be 10%. There were also offerings in the Old Testament that you could give beyond the 10%. And we'll cover today, there was a mention of a different kind of tithe that some called a second tithe or a third tithe or poor fund tithe. Here in the New Covenant, it's not by compulsion, but you want to. You, you do so because you're happy to do so. It's not a have to anymore. It's now a want to. And so I also keep in mind that people claim to tithe, but they when you get down to it, they'll say, I, I tithe 5%. Well, they're using the word tithe to mean I give to the church 5%. The word tithe means 10%. You can't possibly be tithing 5% and, and, and have the true meaning of the word. So if you're giving less than that, you're not tithing. You may be contributing, which is gratefully accepted, I'm sure, but it's not tithing. So I want to make sure you understand tithe means tenth, one-tenth. Let's go to some questions from the last one, part one tithing in the Old Covenant. We're now in the New Covenant and understanding that deeply, that everything you believe must be based on the fact that we are now in the New Covenant. I recommend that you go back and hear my sermons on the glorious New Covenant. And I'll put a link in my notes here to the part two of that sermon. Uh, I think it was a two or three part sermon. Just go back to the one I, I'll link up to in the, in the notes. Being in a new covenant, listen carefully, being in the new covenant goes way beyond. I, I've asked ministers, what's the difference between the new covenant and the old covenant? And they all say, well, in the new covenant, we don't have a temple, priests, Levites, or sacrifices anymore. Other than that, it's pretty much the same. Go back and hear my sermon on it, because that's not correct. It's not complete at least. And so please go back to that link. Now again, the new covenant is not just like the old minus the temple and priests and sacrifices. In fact, without having the temple, priests, Levites, and sacrifices, the rules of old, old get this, the rules of old covenant tithing were completely meshed with those sacrifices, temple and priests and Levites without any of that around anymore, then you have to understand how different it is in the new covenant. If God said to sacrifice or to, I mean, to uh, give your tithes, your main tithe, your first tithe to Levites, and there are no Levites and a temple system and a priest system going on and no temple to accept your food, because remember Malachi 3.8, when God says, you have robbed me, of what's mine, come please and fill my storehouses with food. That's what he says in Malachi 3 verse 10. Where is the food you're supposed to send us? So tithing in the Old Covenant was on grains and meat, meat of the ox, goats, and sheep, and grains, barley, and uh, wheat, and so forth, uh, olives, and in the New Testament, it's very different. I think, I think the biggest reason that too many ministers don't teach the complete story about tithing in the New Covenant is they forget that or don't notice that they're using Old Covenant laws and using them without any changes or very little changes into the New Covenant. Anyway, in the tithing rules in both covenants, I also mentioned this last time, I want to say it again, God's gentleness is really clear. God's gentleness. But what we normally hear being preached at us, and I did it too, 
You're robbing God. If you're not giving 10% of your salary, you're robbing God. And they quote Malachi 3, verse 8, which we'll look at again later. So in the Old Covenant, you didn't tithe um, on sheep and goats unless you had at least 10. I'm saying that to show the gentleness of God. And always, always, God and his Son and the apostles, especially in the New Covenant, said, be sure you're taking care of your family and loved ones even ahead of your tithing. Instead of saying this money is set apart for the temple, remember that where Jesus said, and we'll read that in a minute, where Jesus said, so you make void the law of God, and, no, and you don't take care of your mom and dad who need your help. And so he says that, that even the Old Testament taught us to take care of our loved ones, and certainly you'll find in the New Covenant that we're told that. And again, I want to say, if you were so poor in the Old Covenant that you had no land on which to grow grain from which you tithe, if you had no grains that you reap from your own land, and you had no herds, and you had no flocks, you had nothing to tithe on. I've heard many sermons, several sermons, where the minister said tithing was for everyone, no exceptions. That's not true. The way I see it, that's not true. So what is the truth on it? If you had nothing to tithe because you were so poor, how could you give 10% of nothing? And then also remember that all the Israelites who had something to tithe, when they did tithe, many times they did not, as in the days of, I think it was Hezekiah and Nehemiah and even the days of Malachi, where's your tithes? You're not tithing, you guys. But my point is, the Levites had to tithe what they were given. The, the Israelites tithed to the Levites. The Levites, in turn, gave 10% of the best of their what they got in to the priests. There's nothing I can find, correct me if I'm wrong, nothing I can find where it says the priests were to tithe anything as well. Now, maybe they just put some of what they got into the storehouse as well, but I don't find a verse that says so. Because what came into the storehouse was to feed the priests who were serving at the temple and so on. Also, the question comes up sometimes. Philip, if all you're doing is tithing on grain and the livestock of goat, sheep, and oxen, bulls, and so on, how fair is that to the carpenter, the stonemason, the seamstress, the, the woman who goes around cleaning houses uh, for, for hire, for, for, for a wage? And what about salaries? You said nothing about salaries and wages. And yeah, wages are mentioned dozens of times in the Old Testament. So they knew all about wages. But there is no verse. There is no verse in the Old Testament or the New Testament that says we are supposed to tithe on our wages. So how could that be fair? Now you're penalizing the farmers and you're penalizing the, the ranchers who are growing all this. That's the way some people look at it. But see, unlike today where a lot of people have maybe a third of an acre or half an acre or maybe an acre or two, but not enough to really have grain, uh, especially if all you have is just a third of an acre, quarter acre around your house, or you live in a rental or a condo that, that you own no land at all. Back then, each tribe was given an allotment of land. And then within that tribe, every single household received some land. And on that land, they could have planted some grain. They could have, they probably, some of them had olives already producing fruit, already had vineyards producing wine and, and so on. But in the Old Testament, there's nothing about tithing on salary, nothing. And to claim so is adding something that's not in Scripture, okay? God required a tithe on food. And that's why in Malachi 3.8, when he says that you've robbed me, he goes on in verse 10, that's not often quoted, so now bring the tithes that there may be food in my storehouses. Excuse me, I'm going to make a note here. I want to make sure we put that up on the screen. That there may be food in, our, in the storehouses. Plus, in Numbers 31, 
In Numbers 31, Israel completely routed the Midianites on God's command and absolutely took everything they had, all their animals, all the spoils of war, all their gold, all their silver, and, and all their animals, like I said, and all the women. The, the men were all killed off. The women were killed if they, if they had uh, slept with a man. But the virgin women and children, um, especially the girls, were kept. And those were distributed, uh, like it or not. That's what it says, Numbers 31. But my point is there are listed in Numbers 31 literally hundreds of thousands of sheep and, and goats and so on, hundreds of thousands that were then divvied up to the Israelites and to the priests and so on. Plus, remember, they all were given land when they went in. So when they went into, Is into Canaan, they had houses that they could move into. They had land that was there already being tilled. They had olive trees. They had all of that. And they had animals that they got even from Midian, as well as other uh, people they had conquered as they went along. And then also remember, I got a question. I did cover this in part one, though. I did cover it. So sometimes I wonder if, if, you know, sometimes you have to stop and look at the Bible itself as I'm speaking because you'll miss it if you're doing this while you're driving or doing dishes or whatever. But the question came up, all this, every tenth animal, uh, ox, ox and the goat and sheep that were given to the Levites, where did they put all those animals? Well, I mentioned that in part one. You go back to Numbers 35 read the first five verses, especially verses three and four, and you'll see that God says, around the 48 cities that I want you to give the Levites, which I also discussed, there should be common land all around each one. I think it extended out at least a half a mile out from the walls of the city, at least a half a mile. I think in some cases, maybe more. And God says, so that they have land to put their animals on. All right, so that answers that. A lot of people don't realize the Levites had some land. It wasn't contiguous all in one big allotment like the other tribes. But they did have some land around the 48 cities that were scattered all through Israel. Was tithing required of everyone? I, I mentioned that already. Uh, it, it, I'll, I'll say this too. I'll add this too. I see no scripture in, from Moses' time onward where anyone outside of Israel, or who wasn't living in Israel, who wasn't an Israelite, was required to tithe. It was all required of Israel. In the New Covenant, we are grafted into the Israel of God. The Israel of God is mentioned in Galatians 6.16. The grafting in is in Romans 11. Write it down if you want to go back and read it. I don't have time in this sermon. So we're all now spiritual Jews, like Romans 2, the end of it says that circumcision now is of the heart, and we are now spiritual Jews, whether we're Gentiles or whatever we are, no matter what our race or nationality is. I mentioned also that Abraham had tithed in uh, Genesis 14. But when God gave the rules of what to do with spoils of war in Numbers 31, tithing isn't mentioned. God does ask him to divvy it up among the people and to the priests and Levites, but not, it wasn't 10%. It was not tithing. You can also read that in Deuteronomy 20, verses 10 to 15. Maybe we'll try to post these up as well, but no tithes were required, okay? And then Jacob, I've heard sermons will say, well, Abraham tithed and then Jacob tithed. We have no verse that said Jacob actually tithed. I believe he did. But what Jacob did, and what I preached last time based on Scripture, was that Jacob promised God that he, God would be his God, and that Jacob would tithe if God fulfilled four or five, I think it was five preconditions that Jacob put up. And then he would show his appreciation to God by tithing. Now, tithing as a law was not very, very clear until the time of Moses. And we'll put up Leviticus 27, verses 30 to 32, and you'll see where it says, in all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is Jehovah's, is the Lord's. It is holy to Jehovah. 
by the way, sometimes I would rather go back to the original Hebrew, uh, the, 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 the wording, the, the, the letters that are used for the name of God, YHVH or YHWH, the V's and W's were interchangeable. Um, I think the V came out stronger. So YHVH. And so because the word Baal or Baal, one of its big translations is also Lord. Master. So even Bathsheba, when she said, please, I need some time to go uh, mourn, she asked David for time away to mourn for her Baal, mourn for Uriah, her master, her Lord, her husband. But the word that's there is Baal. It's not always a bad word, but I would much rather say YHVH than the Lord because that's also used of the Baals, the Baals. Uh, go on, it says if someone wants to redeem their tithes, they have to add a fifth to it. And concerning the tithes of the herder flock, it's the tenth one that shall be holy. Okay, now, going on, the, the main first tithe was given to Levi only, to the Levites. I covered that last time. The priests were part of Levi. Levi, uh, the sons of Aaron, became the priests. They were part of Levi. All the other Levites were not priests. So all priests were Levites, but only the sons of Aaron were Levites. And only Levites could eat that first main tithe. It's very clear that this was for the Levites. Numbers 18, 21, and 24. They could eat it anywhere they chose. Look it up in Numbers 18, 21, and 24. I used that in last time. Jews today would feel that they are sinning if they were to tithe to anybody today, because that person is not a Levite, not, and not a priest, and there's no temple to receive those tithes. Do you follow what I'm saying? So that's why, and also in Hebrews 7, 5, indeed those who are sons of Levi, that's commanded, those are the ones who receive that, they have a commandment to receive the tithes. Okay, that first tithe is for Levi, for them to eat, for them to be sustained on. And regular Israelites were not allowed to eat of it or use it. See part one for more explanation on that. Levites then gave 10% of what they got back to the priests. They call it a tithe of the tithe. Now, there were other tithes that were mentioned in the Old Testament. I'm going to have to speed up here for time, so I'm getting behind. Uh, some of you have heard of these, some of you have not. Because I preached to everybody. I don't just preach to Sabbath keepers or anybody else. Anybody coming to this site? There is a, another tithe, two other tithes. The problem is this. Some experts, some rabbis say, no, there's only one tithe that was used different ways at different times. Others say, no, the first tithe was for Levites only, and only they could eat it. So these other tithes that talk about the Israelites eating that tithe that they were saving up for the holy days, for example, that can't be the first tithe. Follow what I'm saying? Josephus, the Jewish historian, was one of those who believed that. So let's talk about that now. Deuteronomy 14. We, many of us call it the second tithe or the festival tithe. And for years and years and years, and I still have been, saving 10%, a second 10%, for this, to have money to keep the holy days of God, to go to a feast of tabernacles, and not worry where's the money coming from for the motel or for uh, temporary dwellings and for meals and all of that to travel to and from. This tithe is clearly different from other tithes. Deuteronomy 14, verses 22 to 27, talking to Israel, you shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. And you, you, not the Levites, not just the Levites, the Levites could share of it, but you shall eat before Jehovah your God in the place where he chooses to make his name abide. The tithe of your grain, of your new wine, your oil, or the firstborn of your herds and your flocks. Okay? That you may learn to fear Jehovah your God always. And then if the journey would be too long, verse 24, you can convert it to money so you're not trying to... You're not trying to pack out bags and bags of corn or wheat. They didn't have corn. Let's talk wheat and barley and all of that. Where your King James says corn, it means wheat, by the way. And so 
you can redeem it for money. And then verse 26, and you shall spend that money on whatever your heart desires. And again, he's talking about food here. He doesn't mean go buy yourself a new Lamborghini. For oxen, sheep, wine, similar drink, and you shall eat there before the Lord your God, before Jehovah your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your household. You shall not forsake the Levite who is within your gates, for he has no part or inheritance with you. That also implies that God does not foresee the priests and Levites becoming enormously wealthy from these tithes. Why would they need assistance? They had so much money anyway, so much in food that they could convert to uh, money. No, he says, Israel, Israelites, you eat this food. It's for you to eat, for you to have food to eat at the feast and share it with the Levites because they, they don't have land uh, like you guys have. They have a little common land around the cities that's mentioned in Numbers 35, verses 1 to 5. So first tithe was eaten only by the Levites. Second tithe was primarily for the one who was saving it for the feast. So we call it a festival tithe or second tithe. It's clearly different. This is Old Covenant. It's not mentioned at all in the New Covenant. It's Old Covenant, okay? Some ministers I know um, do not tithe the second tithe because they're expecting the brethren to give them money or their headquarters sends them a couple thousand dollars or whatever or three or four thousand dollars to have a wonderful feast because, hey, they're spiritual Levites after all. Well, and when I ask, well, how do you get spiritual Levites out of that? The answer I get is, for you are a royal priesthood. And I remind them that Peter said we're a royal priesthood to all brethren, the lay members and the, and the ministers. All of us are brethren. So if they don't have to save a second tithe because they're spiritual Levites, then nobody has to who is of God's church. It doesn't make sense. Jewish historian Josephus, writing after the time of Christ, uh, refers to this festival tithe as second tithe. And it was for keeping the feasts, the holy days, the festivals. And that also implies, again, that the, the Levites were not supposed to be getting very rich because they needed, in fact, some assistance. Now compare that to the mega churches out there and these guys who will get up and proclaim that we're no longer under the law, we're no longer under Moses' law. We're no longer under the Old Covenant. But you better tithe or you're robbing God. As they flash their beautiful, shiny, uh, diamond-studded rings. Mine's just a simple gold band. It's all I've ever had. And, and as they get into their expensive Rolls Royces and expensive cars and fly in their own private jets in a beautiful multi-million dollar mansion that they live in, that is is plain disgusting. That was never God's intent. I certainly don't get the feeling that the Apostle Paul or any of the Apostles traveled around in the latest chariots. I don't. It's just not there. I think Peter, if he were to come back to life and see St. Peter's Basilica with all the gold that's in there, and I've been there many times, would be appalled that in his name they built such a magnificent building full of idolatry, by the way, in it as well. Peter would be appalled. Anyway, so my wife and I still save up for the feast. It's not a requirement that I can see in the New Testament. But if you're going to keep the feast of God, it's good to have some money to do it. So that's what we do, okay? Then there's another tithe called the poor tithe or the third tithe. And you're saying, well, how many are there? This is the last one. In the Old Covenant, in the third and sixth years of every seven-year cycle, there was an arrangement for some money that you would save up and give to the poor that lived within your gates. You administered it. It wasn't sent into a headquarters place. Josephus, the Jewish historian, says there were three tithes, but many uh, rabbis explain it this way, that in, every thir in the third and sixth year, what would have been first tithe would be, was given to the poor instead. So there's confusion and debate over what this third tithe was. But you can see it, the wording of it in Deuteronomy 14, verses 28-29. The wording of it is very, very different from first or second. At the end of every third year, 
and we, we say the third, sixth, and the seventh didn't count because that was the year when there was nothing planted. So you'd have nothing to tithe on in the seventh year. God gave you an increase, a double amount in the sixth year. He promised to bless that way. So you, in the seventh year, you let the land lie fallow and regain its strength. So every third year shall bring the tithe of your produce of that year and store it up within your gates. The Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you. The stranger, fatherless, and widow who are within your gates may come. The poor, the poor, the Levites were considered among the poor, who are within your gates may come and eat and be satisfied. Remember, probably most of the time in the in the time, uh, the 3,500 years between Moses and Christ, most of that time, Israelites were not tithing, I would bet. They were not tithing. That's an expression, guys, okay? And certainly we know that was the case in Nehemiah and Hezekiah's day and, and, and Malachi's day. So God may bless you and so on. So how have you been towards the poor? In the new covenant, God says, always take care of the poor, not just in the third and sixth, Magnified. You can go to my website, by the way, and type in three words, help the poor, in the search bar. And you'll find a sermon I gave in 2011 about the poor. I think many of you would benefit from hearing it. Now, here's another scripture about this third tithe in Deuteronomy 26 this time. Deuteronomy 26, verses 12 to 15. I'll just have to summarize it for time's sake. I'm getting way behind. And here, Moses, or God says to Moses, I think that's what it is here, at the end of your third tithe year, when you've finished laying aside that tithe for the poor, bring it up to God. He calls it here the year of tithing in verse 12. Bring it up to God. Talk to God about it. Say, I've been faithful in this third tithe. It's been difficult sometimes. But now will you bless us and bless all the land for those of us who are tithing? And he goes on to say, I've removed the holy tithe from my house. So again, that's not talking about money that went to the Levites exclusively. Okay. Verse 14, I've not eaten any of it. I've not, so that's not the other tithe that you collect up and you eat of it when you go to the feast. This is another tithe that's for the poor. In verse 15, bless us now. Look down from your holy habitation and bless us. Make, you know, remember, we're being faithful to you, he says, this particular guy. So we personally still have been uh, keeping the essence of this um, much more than just the third and sixth year. I'm not saying that to brag, but just as a teacher telling you what we do. Um, we don't just wait for every third year out of, out of seven. Uh, we're in the spirit of the law, the magnification of the law. So we try to help as often as much as we possibly can, and as privately as we can and you can. This Light on the Rock, we have been helping because of many of you who've been generously helping us, many of the poor right here in America, as well as in other parts of the world. Some orphans would be dead by now if it weren't for the donations of some of you that help us feed them. And God listed something else, by the way, too now. I said that was all the tithing, but there was something else. The Bible says on three specific, these were things I should have covered last time, three specific holy days, Passover, the first day of Passover, Feast of Pentecost or Feast of Weeks, same thing, and the first day of the days of, of, of Feast of Tabernacles, that you were to come prepared with an offering for God, reflecting how much you feel he has blessed you. Let's post that up here, Deuteronomy 16, verses 16 and 70. Maybe it's up already. So I teach, like it says here, collect the holy day offerings three times a year, not seven, not the seven holy days. God was very specific. In fact, he even lists which holy days here. Three times. There's no way that word times means seasons. I've checked it and checked it. It's no way. No translation converts it as seasons. Because that was the teaching, that we could, you know, three seasons, in the spring for Days of Leavened Bread, in the summer for Pentecost, and in the fall for Peace of Tabernacles. 
uh, you are to have offerings. And so there are seven holy days spread out in those three seasons. So let's collect offerings all seven days. That's not what it says. At least the way I read it. My Bible. Deuteronomy 16, verses 16 and 17. Three times. Three strokes. Three occurrences. That's what it means. Three times a year, at least, all your, all your males shall appear. Be, remember the last verse said, you and your household come to these holy days. Here he says, at least your households, uh, at least your males, at least your males shall appear before Jehovah your God. And the place he chooses, which became Jerusalem, Feast of Leavened Bread, Feast of Weeks, which is Pentecost. Seven weeks plus one is Pentecost, meaning 50. And at the Feast of Tabernacles. By the way, I always said it meant count 50. It doesn't mean count 50. It means 50 or 50th. And at the Feast of Tabernacles. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Don't walk into services forgetting it. God says, no, no, this is a marker of how blessed you feel, I have, how well you feel I've blessed you. Every man shall give as he's able. If you go back, as we'll read later on, the Philippians gave beyond their ability. Every man shall give as he's able according to the blessing of the Lord your God, the Yehovah your God, which he has given you. So come prepared. Have your check ready. Have your envelope ready. Have at least your check written out. They might hand you an envelope when you get there. Uh, the amount should be a reflection of your gratitude and gratefulness for how much God has blessed you, verse 17. It's not mentioned anywhere in the New Testament except a general collection, uh, free will offering for the poor saints in Jerusalem during one of the famines. But it, though, that was not a holy day offering. That was, that was just to go help feed the saints. And we have saints right now who need some help being fed. I believe it's always okay to be ready with a voluntary offering to God, even on all seven if you want. But as far as a minister ad admonishing and teaching on it, just read the Bible for what it says. Three times in a year on these specific holy days. That's what I do. Now, if I'm attending with a group that has a collection on the other holy days, okay, I'll give an offering to God. I don't think that's going to hurt me or hurt or feel I'm disobeying God. But... Um, if I was the one teaching it, I would only mention it on those three holy days. So there's much, much more in my part one teaching. And if you haven't heard part one, please go back and hear part one. There's a lot more detail in there. But these things about the second and third tithes and holy day offerings, I didn't even mention in part one before. Now let's take a look at part two, which is tithing in the new covenant. I want to bring to your attention, first of all, we'll go ahead and post it. Uh, Jesus' attitude towards money. He said, focus on the kind of things that are laying for you up treasures in heaven. Don't be trying to get rich. In, in fact, he said that it's very hard for those who seek to be rich and who are rich to enter the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Very hard. So he says, don't focus. Don't, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Don't. The rest of verse 19 you can read, verse 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. There's no moth and rust and so on up there. Heaven is made out of spirit, I believe. Otherwise, there would be moth and rust and dust and decay. For where, yeah, I know there's streets of gold. I believe that's spirit gold. Just me. There's several others who believe that. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He says, make your treasure be up there in heaven. Also remember that Jesus had to fulfill all the laws of the Old Testament up until he died, which he did. Romans 8, verse 3 and 4 says he did. Romans 8, verses 3 and 4 says he did. So anything he did or said up to his crucifixion, Last Supper, crucifixion, resurrection, had to do with fulfilling the commandments in the Old Covenant. He had to. We're going to read here shortly that where Jesus talks about tithing, in one of the two or three places tithing is even mentioned. Some people believe if Jesus mentions something, that it has to be something we have to do today. Remember, he was talking in terms of still being in the Old Covenant himself. 
He also said, for example, in Matthew 5, verses 23 and 24, that if you came to have a gift, an offering at the altar, you're going to sacrifice something or give something, and there you find that you remember someone who has something against you or you against him. He says it different ways, a couple of verses. That you leave that sacrifice, that offering, and go and make, make amends, make, make, make friends again, and then come back. Does that mean that we should still be sacrificing? That we should still be coming to some altar someplace where there is none? So be careful of even things Jesus said, if it applied to things in the Old Testament, to use it in context. Matthew 23, 23, which we're about to read, was spoken to hypocritical Pharisees, while they're all still under the Old Covenant, who were tithing on the produce of the land. And that's why Jesus points out to three little tiny items like mint, anise, and cumin. And you tithe on these little tiny little things, little seeds, little leaves. And he says, but that's not the most important thing. Here Jesus, Yeshua actually says, tithing is not the biggest thing. So let's read it in Matthew 23, 23, 24. Luke 11 has this parallel verse. What are you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites? That's when he was being nice. <laughs> you hypocrites. You pay tithe of mint, anise, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. The bigger, more important things, justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the other undone. He says, do both, but understand that justice, mercy, and faith, justice, mercy, and faith are bigger things to be talking about than tithing. That was Yeshua's teaching. Yeshua, the name his mama called him. The name he said was his name in Acts 20, I think it is, or 26. I forget now where Paul was recounting. And then I heard this voice talking to me in Hebrew. And I said, who are you, Lord? And he answered me in Hebrew, I am Yeshua. He would not have said Jesus. He would have said Yeshua. That's the name he said his name was. Matthew 22, I covered that before in other sermons. Matthew 22, verses 20 to 21. <clears throat> they, they were, again, they were trying to catch him up, the Pharisees and all these other guys. And he says, uh, is it all right to pay taxes and all that? And then uh, he said, bring me a coin. And then he said, Matthew 22, verse 20, 21. Whose image and inscription is this? And he said, Caesar's. They said, Caesar's. He said to them, and notice who he puts first. If you notice this, he does not say pay to God what belongs to God and what's left give to Caesar. He says, I'm sure he was inspired and knew the right order to put things. He knew if the people didn't pay their taxes, they were going to be arrested and go to jail. He said to them, render therefore to Caesar, the first thing he mentions, the things that are Caesar's. Pay your taxes. Pay your taxes. Paul teaches the same thing in Romans 13, verses 6 and 7. Some of you don't. Some of you believe you don't have to. Some of you believe it's idolatry. Nonsense. Yeshua, Jesus said, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And read Numbers 13, 6, and 7 as well, please, that we have to pay our taxes. Yeshua was careful with his word order here, I believe. What else did Yeshua teach on this subject? He also said, take care of your relatives who need your help before, before, you focus on gifts to the temple or your church. Yep. That's what he said. Mark 7, verses 9 to 13. He said, you're nullifying my commands, God's commands, to honor, honor your father and mother by this ridiculous belief you have that you can set money aside for the temple and say, Dad, I don't have anything to give you. Notice what Yeshua, what Jesus said. 
Mark 7, verses 9 to 13. He said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. You're rejecting God's commandment. Moses said, Honor your father and mother. And he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father and mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God, Corban, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God of no effect, verse 13, through your traditions which you've handed down and many such things you do. What's he saying here? He's saying, look, God's gentleness is coming out when he says, I want you to be sure you take care of your aging mom and dad or who, someone who's had a stroke or something like that, or they, they, they're in too much pain to do much anything, or they're just old, but they're your mom and dad. Take care of them before you start giving anything extra to the church. Paul taught the same thing. Of course he did. 1 Timothy 5, verses 3 and 4 and 8. Take care of your loved ones, or you're worse than an unbeliever. Honor the widows who are really widows, but if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn. I'm reading 1 Timothy 5, verse 4 now. Let those children first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents. This is good, acceptable to God. Then jumping down to verse 8. If anyone does not provide for his own, for his own household, for his own relatives, his own loved ones, if any brother, sister, does not provide for his own, especially those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Infidel, unbeliever. Some of you live in Europe or Australia and other places where there's such high taxes, maybe 55, 60%. And if you try to practice three tithes, there simply won't be enough to even feed your own family, let alone your parents. See God's mercy in all of this before you start getting real tough on those who say they've got to take care of mom and dad. They just don't have enough for others right now. Jesus also laid the groundwork for the teaching that if you want to give more than 10%, by all means, do it. And then in Mark 12, verses 41 to 44, using the English Standard Version, it's all these people coming to the treasury and tossing in money into the, into the bucket of money they had there. The rich were giving a lot. Then he saw a poor widow who tossed in two small copper coins, which make a penny. He called his disciples to, to him and said, look, all those who gave all... All that great wealth, they gave a little bit of what they have. But she, verse 44, they contributed out of the abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she has and has to live on. Everything. So here, Yeshua, Jesus, is giving the example. If you want to give more than 10%, by all means, do so. You can. New covenant, magnified. It's not, we're not limited to 10. Now the spirit and intention of the law are included. So we can give more than 10. And also remember, he taught to give alms privately. Normally we aren't to even think about it or tell others about it. I've done a little bit of that in here because as a teacher, just give you, tell you what we're doing. But Matthew 6 verses 1 to 4, he talks about do it privately. Don't even let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Don't think about it. Now, what about supporting the work of God in the New Testament? Aside from Matthew 23, uh, 23 which we just read, that passage with the Luke eleven forty two parallel, combined with Hebrews 7, talking about how Abraham tithed of the spoils, and that was not a law of God requirement. As I mentioned, it's not mentioned in Numbers 31 when God gave the laws on on the spoils of war, he never mentions tithing. He mentions sharing it among the, among the brethren, among the, the, the Levites and priests, but he never mentions tithing, 10%. One other place tithing is mentioned is when the Pharisee and the publican went into the temple to pray, and the Pharisees prayed thus within himself to himself. <laughs> uh, anyway, and I, I give tithes of all I possess. So not just the grain, I'm, I'm so righteous, I give tithes of everything. 
other than those specific places, tithing is nowhere mentioned in the whole New Testament. It's just not. Paul never mentions it or teaches it. He does discuss this, that brethren should, absolutely should, by the Lord's command, be supporting those who are preaching the gospel. From the gospel, they should be supported. He never chastises anyone for not tithing, though, but he corrects a misunderstanding they may have had. Now, Jesus could not have received tithes because he was not a Levite. I know he becomes the order of Melchizedek and all that, but when he was a man walking the streets, he was not a Levite. The Levites were to collect the tithes. It would have been a sin, I believe, if he had required people to tithe to him. We'd all understand it. But that's not what the scriptures said. Only the Levites were to get that first tithe. So how was Jesus uh, taken care of? How was Paul supported? And we're going to find out. They definitely did accept support and offerings from people. Luke 8, Luke 8 verses 1 to 3, comes to pass afterwards, came to pass afterwards, that he went through every city and village preaching and bringing the glad tidings, the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and certain women who had been healed of evil spirits, demons, and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, out of whom came seven demons. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna. And many others who provided for him from their substance. That's how he was taken care of. By these wealthy women and others who provided out of their substance. And our Savior was not reluctant to call people out, say, hey, can I come over and have lunch at your place? Like he did to Zacchaeus. Uh, I get am am amused by that story. In Luke 19, Zacchaeus was short, couldn't see through the throngs of people. And being a tax collector, no one was willing to let him get through, stand in front. So he climbed the sycamore tree. And when Jesus walked by, he said, hey, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, how did he know his name? Well, he's God. He's God in the flesh. Come on down. I gotta, we've got to come to your house. We know you've got a lot of money. And we, <laughs> we, want you to <laughs> we want you to take care of us, feed us. I told you already that um, in, in uh, Luke, what was it? Luke 10, 7, I think it was, that when he sent out the seven, he said, hey, if they, if they want to feed you, accept it. So our master also taught his disciples to accept food and accommodation during their ministries. It was their right. It was their wages. He never says you can safely receive tithes. He never, ever says that. Because you're spiritual Levites now, so you can accept tithes. He doesn't say it. Some of you want me to say it. I'm not going to say it. If my Savior didn't say it, I'm not going to say it. It was still the Old Covenant, so he couldn't say it. The disciples were not Levites. He did not call them spiritual Levites, as many call ministers today. We're all a royal priesthood, whether you're a newly baptized person or whether you're, you've been in the church for ages and ages, whether you're ordained or not. We're all royal priesthood. If you want to say the ministers are spiritual Levites, then we all are. But Matthew 10, verses 7 to 9, as you go preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand and heal the sick, cleanse the lepers. He doesn't just say pray for the sick. By the way, he said heal them. Look at the faith here. Heal the sick. Let's not think that healing's done away with and that it's no longer needed or God's not honoring it anymore. Maybe we ministers have to look at ourselves and wonder. I've, I've had many uh, dramatic healings and I've had many that were not healed. But cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you've received, freely give. Don't go charging 145 bucks. If you send 145 bucks, we'll send you a Bible and this and this and this and this. But if you send only... 30 bucks, you only get this. Don't do that. Provide no, neither gold nor silver nor copper for your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two, two clothing articles, tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs. For a worker is worthy of his food. In Mark 6, verse 10, whatever place you enter house, stay there till you depart from that place. It's okay. It's expected to receive support, accommodation, and food. Provisions. Yeshua said, expect it to those who are preaching the gospel. 
So I think it's shameful, though, when uh, those who have so much coming in in tithes through their mega churches still require people to uh, send in money. They surely have enough to provide people with whatever they're asking for. Some people are going to be too poor to come up with the extra cash to get the things they really want, the, CD, the DVD series or whatever. So what does Paul teach about it? First of all, let's go back to Acts 15. In the conference of all the ministers, what do they, what do they come up with? Do they talk about tithing? They do not. It never came up in Acts 15. Paul, who was never shy about pointing out areas that needed correcting and improvement, like not getting drunk at the Passover, like not going to court against each other, like not having party spirits within the church, I'm a Peter, I'm a Paul, never mentions tithing when he had the golden opportunity in 1 Corinthians 9 to do so. He never mentions it. In the New Covenant, there are no stated tithing laws, but there are clearly stated commands of the Lord to provide for those who are preaching. So let's look at that. By the way, I, 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 I do still send contributions on my salary or income in the New Testament. We can read on Philippians 4.15. It's now called this matter of giving and receiving. Instead of Paul calling it tithing, Paul calls it this matter of giving and receiving. Philippians 4.15. He never mentions the word tithing. It's not a New Testament law to tithe. It is a law. It is a law to support those who are preaching the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9.14. Let's put it up again. The Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel shall live off the gospel. So in the New Covenant, we are commanded to support with money those who are doing God's work and teaching others God's word. Let's start reading what Paul says. And it's about contributions. It's about supporting. And he never uses the words tithes. Never. 1 Corinthians, um, 1 Corinthians 9 I mean, 2 Corinthians. If I'm saying first, I mean second. The command was 1 Corinthians 9, 14, yes. But now, um, here, I'm just going to briefly mention this. This is 2 Corinthians 9, verses 5 to 7. They were collecting money for the needy brethren in Jerusalem. And Paul tells the Corinthians, hey, because he knew they weren't very good at sharing, start preparing now. Verse 6, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 6 now. The person who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. The person who sows generously will reap generously. Each one should give as he has decided in his heart. I'm not giving you a percentage, Paul says. As you've decided in your heart. Now, this is not tithing. This is support for the poor, uh, the poor members in Jerusalem. Okay, God has, has each one has decided in his heart, I'm making a note here, excuse me, not reluctantly or because you have to, not under compulsion, because God loves a cheerful giver. Now we're doing it because we want to, not because we have to. Now Paul also explains, if you go back in Acts 18, I might even post that too, in Acts 18, verses 1 to 3, after speaking and preaching in Athens, he goes to Corinth. And in Corinth, he meets up with Aquila and Priscilla, who were tent makers. And because that's what Paul was by profession as well, he stayed with them and he supported himself by making tents. Shame on the Corinthians. But apparently he did that in Thessalonica and Ephesus as well. You'll find that even to the church at Ephesus, Acts 20, verses 34 to 35, he says, look at my hands, they're all worn down from all the hard work that I've done to supporting myself. He doesn't say, because you guys wouldn't support me, but that's what we all know. The Corinthians would support apparently other traveling and visiting ministers and apostles, but not Paul, not Barnabas. So who did it? Someone wrote me and said, there's no way that Paul could have been doing all that he did without people tithing to him, supporting him wherever he went. That's not the case. Philippians 4, verses 14 to 17, talking to the church in Philippi, 
where he was beaten and chained up and all of that. Philippians 4. I love the book of Philippians. Philippians 4, verses 14 to 17. Nevertheless, you've done well that you shared in my distress. You shared in my distress. You Philippians. Listen to the wording here. Now you Philippians know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, except you. The Corinthians didn't, the Ephesians didn't, the Thessalonians didn't, the Thessalonians didn't, for even in Thessalonica you sent aid once and again for my necessities. No church supported me. No church helped me have money to buy food and a place to stay. Aquil and Priscilla put them up, I guess, in Corinth. Now, this is the New Covenant approach, but he never mentions tithing. This would have been the perfect time to do so. And let's read 1 Corinthians 9. He doesn't call it tithing, but concerning giving and receiving. If you wish to see how it was the Philippians who provided for Paul, go back and read that again. I read part of it, Philippians 4, verses 14 to 19. Now let's look at Paul's inspired teaching about how we are supposed to support the ministry, the true ministry. The true ministry. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 3 to 14. I hope Light on the Rock is one of the true ministries. If you're being fed by four or five or six different ministries, then divide your contributions to those four or five proportionately for how much you feel you're getting from each one. First, I've had to retire, by the way. I, I just can't keep the stress of my job. I'm almost 70, uh, just months away, and uh, I'm ready for a stroke or heart attack if I don't take some of the stress off, and I wanted to focus more on light on the rock. But it's tough. It's tough financially. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 3 to 14. My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we have no right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife, as do other apostles and, and the brothers of the Lord, you know, James and Jude, or Peter, Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? So they're supporting the other apostles as they would come around, or maybe they'd send the money to them. Whoever goes to war at his own expense... Who plants a vineyard doesn't eat of its fruit? Who tends a flock and doesn't drink of the milk of the herd? Do I say these things as a mere man? Doesn't the law itself tell us that the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the corn, the grain? You know, they went around and around tied to this big stone that would be mashing the wheat that was in there. Is it oxen God so concerned about, or is it really for us that he says these things? For us, no doubt, that he who plows should plow in hope. And he who threshes in hope should be partaker of this hope. If we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap you from you material things? So look what he's saying. This would have been the perfect time to talk about tithing, and he does not. If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Now, nevertheless, we've not used this right. Right there. We haven't made you support us. But we endure all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple, and those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar? That's Numbers 18, by the way, verses 8 to 10. If you want to look it up, look it up. Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live by the gospel. It is a commandment of God that if you're being fed spiritually, that you support those who are feeding you spiritually. That's what it says. Now, tithing in the New Testament, New Covenant, is not at all about grains, herds, and fruit. They're not even mentioned. Now it's about money, wages, salary, income, financially supporting ministries that are supporting you with the Word of God, feeding you. And that includes us, I hope, right here at Light on the Rock. So many will, will tell me how much they're getting out of Light on the Rock, but rarely, I have a handful, five or six people, and that's it, four or five people, uh, that will send us some money every month, and it uh, ranges from $35 on up. But, but um, 
somehow I think people feel thank you for the good the good messages, the good sermons, but they never send money in. I'm telling you, look at what the Bible says. Thank you, those of you who are hearing it. Thank you. Appreciate it. And then in 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 to 4, Paul lauds, praises the Philippians again, the Macedonians um, in Philippi. 2 Corinthians 8, 1 to 4. Moreover, brethren, we made known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, meaning Philippi, that in a great trial of affliction, the, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty, their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. Paul's telling the Corinthians, you guys can learn something from the Philippians. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, beyond their ability, they were freely willing. And then 2 Corinthians 11, verses 7 to 9, Paul says, Did I commit sin and, and because I preached the gospel to you without charging for it? I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to minister to you. It's on the screen right now. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 7 to 9, I'm reading. I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to minister to you. And when I was present with you and in need, I was a burden to no one. For what I lacked... The brethren who came from Philippi, from Macedonia, supplied it. That's the New Covenant teaching on supporting God's work. It's not on tithing. It's on supporting God's work and being like the Philippians at times, sometimes even abounding beyond what they were able, not limited to 10%. So if you're supporting spiritual food, whether from us or anybody else, support those ministries. If it's more than just one or two or five or whatever, split your support money accordingly. But remember, we're doing the work as well. We may not have booklets and all that that we're putting out there, although we're getting some things translated into Kiswahili in Kenya. And uh, that, you know, I have to pay for the full time that these members are, who are educated are, are putting into it so that the rest of the brethren and others can, can also share who don't speak English. Anyway, so we're also preaching the work of God, doing the work of God. John 6, 28, 29, someone came to Jesus and said, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus, or Yeshua, answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Believe in Jesus. Believe in Yeshua. That's, if someone teaches you how to have a relationship with Yeshua, they're doing the work of God. And that is our focus here at Light on the Rock, to have the light is Christ, the rock is Christ. And we're constantly teaching to have utter and complete faith in him and seek him, be one with him, have him uh, come to know Jesus. That was Paul's greatest mission. And uh, Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy saying that those who do the word of God well should be worthy of double honor. The labor is worthy of his wages. So there again. So in the New Covenant, it's no longer tithing on grains, on the fruit of the land, the produce of the land and flocks, but sharing your money, your wages, your income, your finances to support those who are doing the work of God. Please do that, and please do support that. So like I said, I'd be frank, I, ha I can't do this, I can't work full time any longer. So I, I live off whatever I have in Social Security and a little bit of residual income uh, from from other things that we had, not very much, but it, it's it's tidying us over. I would gladly accept help from any of you if you're willing to send us some help. Just go to Light on the Rock homepage and look, and 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 then look under the about about at the top of the page. Click on that, and you'll see an option there to donate. I don't make a great big thing about donate now, send money now. I don't, but go to Light on the Rock, go to about. We'll put put on the screen, and at the top of the page. Hit about, and then it'll pop down to donate to Light on the Rock, LTR. And I have the address to donate to if you wish to do that. One thing I want to end with, wrap up in the next 10 minutes or so, or less, helping the poor in the New Covenant. It's very easy for us when we hear about people uh, who really are in need to say, we're praying for you, we're, you're, you're in our thoughts and prayers. And do nothing. Do nothing. James 2, verses 15 to 17, 
If a brother or sister is naked, destitute of daily food, and one of you says, Depart in peace, be warm, be filled, you're in my thoughts and prayers, but you do not give them the things that are needed for the body, what does it profit you? Thus faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. So, please be helping the poor as well. Look in my notes. I'll put more in my notes and I have time to do so here. Go back and read Matthew 25. We'll post it now. When Jesus comes back and the nations are assembled before him, and when the Son of Man comes in its, whole, in its glory, Matthew 25, 31, the holy angels with him, he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, then the sheep on the uh, on the right and the goats on the left. And then he'll say to the sheep, Thank you. I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. Have you done those things? Really? Literally? When did you buy clothes for somebody? When was the last time you, you had someone sick that you went to go visit in their home? When was someone in prison and you went to them? I'm trying to go to a prison right now. If somebody who's a relative, someone in the church. It's not easy right now, but I'm going to do that. I was hungry. And the righteous will say, when did we do all that? We never saw you hungry, naked, poor, and all, all that. When did we do that? Verse 40, he said, when you did it to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, my brethren. When you did something, you didn't just pray for them. You did something. You didn't just tell them you'd pray for them. You did something. You didn't just wish them well. No, you provided money for food and clothing and all of that. We need some help helping out the poor that we are helping, including in Kenya and other places. So the point is, take care of the poor as much as you can. Don't wait for the third and the sixth years. Give more than 10%. In fact, pure religion is described in James 1.27 as helping orphans and widows. There's a lot of discussion about three tithes. But they're not mentioned in the New Covenant, but the concepts, the principles are. Make sure you have enough money to go to the feast. Make sure you are helping the poor. Therefore, any discussion about tithing on the increase, as I was asked to discuss from the Old Covenant, the word increase just means produce. That's all it means. But there's a lot of discussion about how do we come to the increase? Do we tithe on net or gross? If you pay what you owe to Caesar first, as Jesus mentioned first, and then give to God what is God's, that to me is telling me God in his gentleness is telling us to tithe on net, not gross. Tithe on gross if you want. Go beyond 10% if you want. But in the New Covenant, it's not even on tithing. It's on this matter of giving and receiving, like Philippians 4, uh, what was it, verse 14 or 15 says. If you wish to continue doing the Old Covenant model, then so be it. 10% first tithe, 10% second tithe, 10% third tithe in your third and sixth year out of seven. What's more important is support the ministry, no matter where you're from, no matter what your skin color is, no matter what your ethnicity is. Just do it. And if you disagree with this presentation, show me where I'm wrong in Scripture. not what makes sense to you or what you've always believed. It doesn't carry any water with me. It doesn't matter with me. So God bless you as you live in this biblical understanding. And if some of you choose to send support to us at Light in the Rock, let me say right now, thank you. May God Almighty bless you tremendously for that. With more support, we'll be able to get the word out to much more of the world and by ad time and so on so people can see the, these sermons and, and be aware of them. Anyway, I hope you've learned a lot about tithing. I frankly learned a lot from preparing it. I didn't know much about the land around the Levitical cities or the Levites had a little bit of land. They didn't have a lot of land, but, and, and just other things there, you know, and um, the things Yeshua said, Jesus said. So let's end this in prayer. Father in heaven, you who own all things have let us have some of what belongs to you to work with and use 
And you want 10% back in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, you want maybe even more back as we support your ministry, those who are faithful and loyal to you in your truth. Father, may those who have heard this sermon, may they be moved to action, moved to obey you. The command of the Lord is to those who preach the gospel should be taken care of by the gospel, provided for by the gospel. Father, thank you for blessing us. Thank you for your ways. Thank you for your words. Bring more people, Father, into your truth. Call more people. And may we be joyful in seeing the ones you are bringing together. We praise you. We glorify you. In Jesus, in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others. <music>